Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to this, our evening service. As we come into the presence of our God, uh, um, we're, our call to worship this evening comes from Psalm 16. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. And I will not pour out their libations of blood, or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me a portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, and surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices, and my body will also rest secure, because you have not abandoned me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life, and you will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. So this is the God that we've come to worship this evening, this kind, merciful, gentle, and good God, who is faithful to us, and who offers us good things. But he's also the God who rescued the Lord Jesus from the grave. So we're going to declare the glory and the wonder of our God as we uh, sing this, our opening hymn, which is Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty.
Lord, we join with the angels and with the archangels, with the cherubim and the seraphim around the glorious throne. We remember the vision of Isaiah. We remember, dear Lord, that the holy ones who have never sinned, the, those created to give you glory in the very throne room of heaven, are ashamed and they cover their faces and their feet in your presence. So glorious and so holy you are. And then night and day they cry out, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. And who are we, O oh Lord, as sinners to come into your uh, presence? And yet, Lord, you, this holy, holy God, love us. And you've shed the blood of Jesus. You have blessed us. You've had mercy on us. You've helped us to join all of the other saints of God that you have bought and redeemed. You delight in us. You are our good, our source of nourishment and strength. You've given us a safe place to meet. We worship you and we adore you. We thank you and praise you, Lord, that in the words of uh, Psalm 16, that you have not abandoned us to the grave. Because you didn't let your Holy One, the Lord Jesus Christ, see decay. He won the victory over the grave. And you made known to us the paths of life. And now, dear Lord, we pray that you would fill us with joy in your presence. And that we would have a glorious foretaste of the eternal pleasures at your right hand. Mm. Fill us with all of these good things tonight. Help us to rejoice that we have come out. Help us to rejoice that we have met with the living God. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. 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 We're going to stand again and sing. And as we come to the table, we're just going to ask Jesus to come and shine his light into, the, uh, into our hearts. Reveal to us the wonder of his grace through this bread and wine. And show us something of the radiance of his face. some devotional applications to the table of the Lord. We come in safety. Keep me safe, O oh God. Renew and take refuge. And this is our refuge. This is our acceptance. This is our glorious God inviting us to sit at the family table. 
This is where we can say, you are my God. And apart from you, I have no good thing. If you're hungry, if you're genuinely physically hungry, we can get you a meal afterwards, but uh, you're not going to be able to satisfy your earthly hunger through a tiny little bit of bread and through a tiny uh, little cup. But if you're hungry for God, if you're hungry for more of Christ, this is what Jesus does. He invites us to come into his presence and to taste and see that he is good, to ingest and be nourished by his heavenly goodness, to uh, be refreshed through the glory that he has for us in heaven. It says, as for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. And isn't it good to know that God takes delight in us, not for our own sake, but because of Jesus. And we don't do this alone. We, we are not the exclusive owners of the truth of God. We join our brothers and sisters in many different denominations across the whole world. Lord, you have assigned for me my portion and my cup. So the portion of bread is small and the cup is small. But oh, the portion in heaven is great. We ask for that spiritual union with Christ, that we would be drawn closer into him. And in a mystical way, we don't fully understand. Maybe we'll understand it one day when we're in glory, but Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. And so we taste and see feeding on the Lord Jesus Christ, sat at the right hand of the Father. As he proclaims his victory over sin, as he presents his wounds to his heavenly Father, as he intercedes on our behalf, this is our portion, this is our cup. And how else can we respond other than to say that boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places? I have a delightful inheritance. And we respond to grace, to mercy. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. And so the intention is never just to meet with Jesus at this table, but to go away strengthened and blessed by him and to continue to be feed, fed by him throughout the week. Even when we can't sleep at night, to know that he is with us and he loves us. Therefore, our hearts can be glad, glad, and our tongues can rejoice, and our bodies can rest secure, knowing that we will not be abandoned to the grave because God didn't let his Holy One see decay. The resurrection was victorious. The guarantee that you and I will be rescued from death. And therefore, God, through the gospel, has made known to us the path of life. He fills us now with a foretaste of joy in his presence. And it's only a foretaste because there are eternal pleasures at God's right hand forever and ever and ever. This is our good God. Let's bow and pray to him. Lord, it is good to be a Christian. It is a joyful and wonderful thing to know that we are loved, that we are forgiven. Lord, we confess that we do need things to be forgiven. We haven't loved you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. We haven't loved our neighbor as ourself. We've broken the Ten Commandments, and Lord, we cannot boast of our own good works. But we thank you that we don't have to anymore. All we need to do is look to Christ. And with love and gratitude, rejoice that we are accepted. Because in him is all of our goodness. Apart from him we have no good thing. And in him, dear Lord, we have love and acceptance for the victory that he has won. And so Lord, help us to taste and see that Jesus is good. Help us to spiritually feed on all of the victory that he has won over the grave. Lift up our hearts into the very throne room of heaven and help us to know and be nurtured by that glorious resurrected power. Be comforted by his intercession. And fill us with joy in your presence. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Paul tells us that what he received from the Lord is what he also passed on to us. 
the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we break this bread. And there are earthly bodies feast on earthly bread, dear Lord. Lift up our hearts and souls into the very throne room of heaven. Let us know that we have met with you. We have met with and been joined closer and more intimately to that resurrected body that sits at the right hand of the Father. Fill us with joy, knowledge and satisfaction in that deeper unity that we have with you. And may that unity, dear Lord, draw our hearts closer to one another. Bless us, dear Lord. And we pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> We have a, um, a gluten-free option, if you'd like that, to ask the steward for, um, uh, for that. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it, in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We'll distribute the cups, hold on to them, and then we'll pray and we'll drink together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the cup that is the new covenant in your blood. 
We thank you that this blood washes away our sin, our shame, our regret, and renews us from the inside out. Lord, draw us closer to that reality in heaven. In Jesus' in precious name. Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you for your great, great love, for your acceptance, the power of redeeming grace, for freedom from guilt and shame, for newness of life in you, Lord, all of these things are blessings. It will take all eternity for us, dear Lord, to plumb the depths of what you have done for us. But Lord, thank you for these foretastes of the joy to come. Give us strength through the coming week, Lord. Help us to go on in this strength. Help us to live and move in your power. Help us to recognize your mercy and grace. Oh Lord, please. Build us up and help us to overcome. Lord, we come to you with uh, worries about our friends and our family. We lift up to you Donna. We ask for blessing, healing for her, that she would have a, real, a really good night's sleep tonight, that she would be relaxed tomorrow about the operation, that she would wake up after the operation reju rejoicing that uh, you have looked after her. I pray for wisdom for the doctor and for the nurses and everybody else that there will be a real sense of calm and love and reassurance and so that uh, she wouldn't be traumatized by, uh, by the operation and that she would come up feeling uh, better and that you would give her full healing again soon. Mm -hmm. Lord, we pray for Edna. We ask that she, uh, she would be able to return home soon. Have mercy on her and bless her. Lord, some of us are worried about our aging parents. Some of us have long distances to travel to see them. And Lord, we pray that you would overcome those distances. That you would look after us and as we travel, that, that you would look after our loved ones. Lord, we remember your commandments to honour your mother and father, and this is what we want to do. Please, please, bring healing. Have mercy. We pray for those of us that are worried about our, our loved ones, our other loved ones, brothers and sisters, cousins, children, grandchildren, husbands, wives. Lord, the need is very great. But we bring them into your presence and ask for resurrection healing, for mercy and grace. And more particularly, we pray for their salvation if they don't know Jesus yet. Please soften their hearts and bring them to Jesus. Lord, we pray again for our nation. And again, Lord, we call out to you. We have learned nothing from your word. We're We've departed from it and we're lost as a nation. We have a new government and yet things never seem to change. Because, Lord, it's not a, a new, new people in Parliament that we most need. It's a new King of Kings. A renewed sense that the government rests upon your shoulders, Lord Jesus. A new loyalty to you and to your kingdom. This is our greatest need as a nation and we ask again that you would pour out your mercy and build up your church. We pray for the work of Sussex Gospel Partnership. We thank you and praise you for them, for all the good teaching that they offer, offer um, for all of the um, seminars that they run and the courses that they run to raise up a new generation of teachers. Continue to bless that work. Lord, uh, we really want to see all of your faithful churches get stronger and stronger, more faithful, more loyal, 
more passionate about you. But Lord, this requires miracles. It requires you to pour out your Holy Spirit to do what just mere teaching can't accomplish by itself. Give it supernatural power, supernatural grace, Lord. And draw people to yourself. Lord, we know that change will come to this nation, but it will only come if you resurrect your church, if you revive us, if you send down your Holy Spirit and bring new life. And so, Lord, please bless all like-minded churches, but bless us as well. Have mercy on us and help us to do and work alongside them in your harvest field. Finally, Lord, we pray for the persecuted church. Again, Lord, we just lift up to you all that are suffering for the name of Jesus. Please give them all the strength, all the hope, all the joy that they need in you. May that supernatural uh, ability to overcome the persecutions be the most powerful witness of, that you are a miraculous God. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 We're going to stand and sing again, and we're going to remind ourselves of the greatness of the gospel. Great is the gospel of our glorious God. Lovely Welsh hymn by Vernon Hyam. Uh, Vernon Hyam was a, a tremendously gifted preacher in the end, end of the 20th century. I think he died in 1999, if I'm not mistaken, or certainly the early 2000s. I heard him preach once or twice, and it's got that lovely Welsh way of speaking, a real melody in his voice and everything else. But his love for the Lord Jesus always came out in it, and he was a greatly gifted uh, um, hymn writer as well. So uh, let's stand and sing, Great is the Gospel of our Glorious God. Yeah. Hey.
to Romans chapter 3, on page 1130, page 1130, and we're looking at Romans chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 9 down to verse 20. Romans chapter 3, verse 9. Our God and Father, we pray that you would speak to us through this, your holy word, mm -hmm. that you would give us hearts willing and able to hear what you have said, and you would help us to rediscover the joy of our salvation. And that we would appreciate even more deeply what it costs for you to rescue us. And that we would trust you more deeply. Oh, give us a deeper love of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As you've, um, many of you know, um, Paul has been trying to convince this uh, church in Rome uh, with probably a majority of uh, Gentiles uh, with a minority of Jews. But there's some kind of conflict, some kind of division between them, and Paul is trying to persuade them, no, no, God wants you to be one people. He wants to, you to know that he has changed you from within. So he's already said uh, that a man is not a, a Jew if he's only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew, a man is a member of the people of God, if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from, God, from men, but from God. Uh, the, there was um, Gentile Roman um, philosophers and a strong influence by the likes of the Greeks, the, the Plato and Aristotle. Uh, so there were moral pagans that tried to live a moral life. And they could delude themselves that they were good enough for God. But much, uh, probably the majority of the Roman world was as immoral as our own nation. As careless and thoughtless of the things of God. They went through the outward form of the pagan rituals. But there was no real change of heart and life. So it's quite easy in that context for a religious Jew to feel quite smug. And think, okay, I'm better than these other people. It was a weakness that some of the Jews uh, felt within their hearts. And so Paul is trying to convince both the moralists and the immoral among the Gentiles and the hypocrites among the Jews. Actually, none of us, Jew or Gentile, can rescue ourselves. We're all lost. And so he comes up with this big long list. And he's trying to say, look, this is the teaching of the whole of the Old Testament. This is the teaching of the whole of the Old Testament scriptures. So this is the word of God. It says, what shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We've already made charge that the Jews and Gentiles are alike, are all under sin. As it's written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They've together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers is on their lips, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood, ruin and misery mark their ways, in the way of peace they have not known, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced before God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. This is God's word to us this evening, and it's not the most cheery of, of passages. And uh, if it was up to me, I'd skip passages like this, and I'd give a nice encouraging sermon, but this is God's word. And so it's important that we accept all of God's word, and we don't skip over these more difficult passages. Because it helps us to appreciate our salvation all the more. It gets rid of our hypocrisy, our temptation to feel smug and independent, our temptation uh, to become legalistic and start to think that actually God loves me a bit more than other Christians because I'm an evangelical or because I read my Bible, because I'm a, a good person or whatever else it is. It keeps us humble and it uh, helps us to, uh, to recognize, no, all of us, without exception, 
are completely dependent on God's grace. And so he starts to quote, and the first of the quotes that he gives sound extreme. There's no one righteous, not even one. Come on. Uh, we, we've all got a good friend who's a really, really nice person. And they're very kind and they work in a charity shop. And uh, if you ever had a problem, they jump in the car and they help you out straight away. Are you saying that that person isn't righteous? That sounds a little bit extreme. There's no one who understands, no one who seeks after God. But I know plenty of people who are spiritual and who are, uh, you know, they, they're curious about spiritual matters and uh, they want to understand God. But this is the reality because this isn't, to, uh, these things aren't said from a human perspective. These things are said from a divine perspective. These things are said from God's viewpoint, and it is God who knows the truth of our hearts. It's God who looks down at this earth. It's God who has set the standards of what true righteousness is. And the standard is so high that only God himself in Jesus Christ was able to meet them. God is a perfect God. He's an infinite God. He is infinitely perfect. He is holy, holy, holy. And therefore, his standards of righteousness are infinite holy, holy, holiness perfect divinity. And we all fall short of that. So yes, the sweet little person that works in their charity shop, they're a blessing to our community and we thank God for them. But they're not perfect. They're not holy. In fact, sometimes uh, that person can end up thinking, I don't need Jesus because I am a nice person. Which is pride and hypocrisy. There is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands, no one who seeks after God. See, the difficulty with all other religions and all other spiritualities is that it's not, this, uh, it's not seeking for the God who has revealed himself. God has spoken through his word. His people, G Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. We hear the voice of Jesus speaking to us with authority through the word of God and we respond accordingly. God has intervened in history. God has done that repeatedly over one and a half thousand years. He's raised up uh, men and sometimes even se sections by women to write these parts of the Bible and bring them all together to speak with one authoritative voice. And those that genuinely seek after God, seek after God on God's terms and accept God on his terms as he's revealed himself. It's interesting that if you look at all of the other religions of the world and all of the other spiritual paths that are out there, there always seems to be an instinctive reaction to the way of Jesus. It's either I can take the Bible and Jesus and I can integrate him into the religion that I'm inventing for myself, or I want nothing to do with it. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And so, although it sounds, well, it's ridiculous that there's no one who understands and seeks after God. Actually, no one seeks after God by nature, on God's terms. And those that do, do so because they respond to the authority of the voice of God speaking to us through the scriptures. They've all turned away. They've all become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. And that's the problem. There's admirable things in the life of, of, of many religious people. Those are commendable and I'm sure that we would far, far rather live uh, next to a uh, honest Hindu or a kind Muslim than, sit, uh, than live next door to a hypocritical, dishonest Christian. But those things don't rescue those things don't meet the infinitely high standards of God. Our God sets the rules and we come to him on his terms. He's the one who says what is good. And what's the greatest good of all? It's Jesus. What's the greatest good of all? It's the gospel. What's the greatest good of all? It's the gift that God freely gives of life and mercy and forgiveness. And to reject that 
uh, that divine source of goodness is the greatest act of arrogance and rebellion in all of reality. And so, although these things uh, um, initially may seem a little bit extreme, if we start to look at them from God's viewpoint, they make perfect sense. There's no one who does good, not even one. Then he talks about the, the problem of the tongue. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers is on their lips, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. These are all a list of, some, of uh, sins of the, uh, of the mouth. Our mouths are made by God to reflect God's goodness and to speak God's truth and to speak God's truth with love, mercy, gentleness and kindness to uphold God's standards of righteousness and to treat one another as if we're made in the image of God to treat one another as if we have infinite worth and, inter and eternity uh, uh, eternal souls that need redemption, mercy and forgiveness you, I'm sure, have been lied against in the past at some stage. I, I know I have. You've had people gossip about you. You've had people lie about you. You've had people uh, mis misrepresent who you are. You've had people who mocked you or who lied to you. And you know how painful that was. You can remember all of those times and maybe it's still something that traumatizes you to this moment and it's so disturbing that I've even rem reminded you of those things. Now can you imagine things from God's perspective? I think the worst offense that you've ever felt because of what, uh, uh, what people have said against you. And multiply that eight or nine billion times across the world. In each of those times where the name of Jesus has been used as a swear word, in each of those times where God has been misrepresented or uh, the, the sacrifice of Jesus has been mocked, can you imagine how deeply that grieves the heart of God? If you have been grieved by the way that you have been spoken against, imagine how our loving God is so grieved to the very core of his being. When people say, here's a nice religion, here's a respectable thing, it, all, it doesn't matter, the sacrifice of Jesus uh, isn't really that important, it's a little bit extreme that Jesus is, is the way, the truth, and the life. To explain away what God has revealed about himself in the Bible and trivialized it and relativized it or denied it or explained it away. We live in a day and age where the number one source of information that people get is the TV. The internet increasingly this, uh, these days it's also what's taught in the schools and what's taught in the universities. And these are very clever, plausible sounding people. They're slick communicators, they're eloquent, they're informed, uh, they're uh, funny, they're charming, they're wise, they're serious. Uh, they are come across as highly uh, intellectual, clever people or whatever it is. Yet again and again, they use those uh, pulpits to preach. You can't really trust the Bible. Those Christians, they're really mean, horrible people. Jesus didn't, probably didn't exist, and if he did, he was just a nice man. You can't really trust the Old Testament. It's just full of fairy tales and any number of other things. A gift of speech, a reflection of the character of God himself, the very nature of God. Think of John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's something about speech that is a, a reflection of the very character of God himself. And we take those things, and we use it to deny people eternal life. To destroy the only possible way of salvation. And so when you start to recognize that lies and distortions and misrepresented of God lead to hell, they lead to the grave, they lead to the poison of sin, they increase the power of Satan, and suddenly these verses, verses 13 and 14, seem entirely appropriate. If that's what misrepresenting God's truth does, their throats really are open graves. They really do practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. 
those poisonous lies that draw people away from Christ. Destroy them. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. And it goes on to talk about not just the things that we say, but the things that we do. Their, their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways in the way of peace. They have not known there is no fear before their eyes. Some of these quotes come from the Psalms. Um, for example, Psalm 14. Psalm 14 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, their deeds are vile, there is no one who does good. God looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there's any who understand, any who seek after God. They've all turned aside, they've all become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Paul's alluding to that. It would be easy for the Jew in the, uh, um, in the Roman church 2,000 years ago to think, oh, well, that's just the Gentiles. Well, they, the Gentiles uh, don't acknowledge the true God who's spoken through the Bible. But yes, this was true. Yes, uh, the, uh, the Gentiles at that time denied God, just as Psalm 14 said. It was true of them, and uh, it was an appeal to the Gentiles' conscience. But the second half of this list is a, a, a reference to uh, Isaiah 59. In Isaiah 59, it's unambiguously addressed to the, uh, the uh, Israelites or to the uh, Judaites of the Old Testament. Psalm 59, uh, uh, sorry, Isaiah chapter 59 says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. This is a problem for the Jews as well. And it's a problem for us because the Jews aren't uniquely wicked. They're not exceptionally sinful. They're just representatives typical of all of humanity. They're typical of you and me as well. Your sins have hidden your face from you so that God will not hear your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue mutters wicked things, there's no one who calls for justice, no one who pleads his case with integrity, they rely on empty arguments to speak lies, they conceive trouble and give birth to evil, they hatch eggs of vipers and spin a spider's web, whoever eats their eggs will die when one is broken and adder is hatched, the cobwebs, cobwebs are useless for clothing and they cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their deeds are evil, and acts of violence are on their hands. Their feet rush to sin, they're swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are evil thoughts. Ruin and destruction mark their ways, the way of peace they have not known. There's no justice in their paths. They've turned them into crooked roads, and no one who walks in them will know peace. Justice is far from us. Righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but we're all in darkness. For brightness, we walk in deep shadows. Like the blind, we grope on the wall, we feel our way like men without eyes. At midday we stumble as it were in the twilight. Among the strong we're like the dead, we growl like bears, we moan mournfully like doves. We look for justice but find none for deliverance, but it's far away. This is a mess. This is just as true of our own country in the present day and age. Just as it was true in... Isaiah's time, two and, a half, two and a half thousand years ago. It's the mess that we're all in. And we need rescue. God is trying to convince us you cannot rescue yourself. We've worked incredibly hard since the Second World War to try and build a welfare state and to try and care for the poor. And much of that's been commendable. And yes, people have been rescued from poverty and Yes, there's more prosperity that there, that, uh, than there's ever been. But have we managed to get rid of poverty? Look around us. Instead, family life has decayed. Children are raised without fathers. Mothers give birth to children from multiple fathers. And poverty grows. Drink and drugs and everything else grows. And for all of our human efforts to try and solve the world's problems, for every good thing that we manage to accomplish, it seems to uh, raise another dozen problems in its place. Because we cannot rescue ourselves. And none of these things, commendable though they may be, change the human heart. 
Only God can change the heart. And that's why we do what we do. We long for people to come and meet with God. We long for them to put aside their own desire to save themselves. We commend them for, the, for their desire to do good things. But we also recognize it's not until Jesus that the, this problem's worlds will be thoroughly fixed. But change your heart. One heart at a time. Bring people under the authority of the word of God. Bring people uh, to, to leave their guilt and their shame at the foot of the cross. And to find new strength and new power. To live a new life. Bring them into the community of God and let them use their gifts among each church. Let them then use the, 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 uh, the family of God to reach out and start making a difference. That's where true, lasting difference happens. The world has destroyed the church and this nation as much as possible. But it hasn't given anything better. There's no alternative that secularism has built that substitutes the church or is anything better than the church. It's just isolated people and left them lonely, purposeless, empty. So don't worry about it. If you're feeling wretched, take these pills, take these drugs, watch a bit more TV, watch a little bit more pornography, do whatever it is to blot out the pain. But nothing better. But we have the truth. This is why we should treasure it. And rather than, uh, than uh, trying to make ourselves righteous, we simply say, Lord, you speak the truth. But Lord, we can then look back at this and we can reverse it. We can have that divine change about through the power of the gospel and the love of Jesus. Lord, there is none righteous, but you have given me the righteousness of Jesus. Lord, there is no one who seeks and understands, no one who seeks after God, but God, you sent Jesus seeking after me. All have turned aside and become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. Oh, that's almost true. Almost true. But there is one who did good. There is one who did good, and that's the Lord Jesus. And he did that good on my behalf. Oh yes, Lord, I've lied, I've, uh, I've gossiped. Mm -hmm. Your throat is an open grave because you have conquered the grave. You burst out of that tomb and you have declared your victory over death itself. Your tongue no longer uh, has never practiced deceit. Rather, you speak the truth in love. Rather than the poison of vipers, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, you come with grace on your lips, life transforming mercy and joy on your lips. Your mouth is never full of cursing and bitterness, but rather joy, mercy and goodness. Your feet are not swift to shed blood because your feet were hung upon that cross and those cruel nails went through them. Ruin and misery no longer mark your ways because you went to ruin and misery on that cross on our behalf. And you have made known to us the way of peace. And you have shown us that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And you have led us through that fear of God, recognizing the holiness of God himself, and brought us beyond that into the very love, mercy, and forgiveness of our God. We take all of these things, and everything is different in the eyes of, when we see it through the eyes of Jesus. And we respond. We respond in love and adoration and we say, oh Lord, I want to live now your way. I can't rescue myself. I know I, can't, uh, I cannot be declared righteousness, uh, righteous in your sight by observing the law. All I can say, Lord, is that by the law you expose my sin. But by exposing my sin, I bring it into the light. I leave it at the foot of the cross. And there, O oh Lord, I long for your redemption. There, O oh Lord, I receive your mercy, grace, and forgiveness. Because you are a good God, a kind God, and a merciful God. And therefore, Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving me something better in Jesus. Help me to live out of that. Help me to be salt and light in this dark world so that more and more and more people can accept the truth. 
and come and receive Jesus for themselves. Let's pray. Oh God and Father, we thank you and praise you for the mercy that we have in Jesus, for the grace, the goodness, the power, the life-transforming uh, um, acceptance that we have. We thank you most of all for grace, because we don't deserve any of this. We see ourselves written about in these, Lord, and this is what you've rescued us from. Help us, dear Lord, to turn all of these things the right way up again, so that we can become what Jesus wants us to be. Help us to use our lips to sing your praises and to tell the truth. Help us to seek you and to depend on the righteousness of Christ. Help us to love the blood of Jesus and to love life and to be peacemakers. Help us to love the way of peace. I fear you, love you, respect you, and trust all of your generous and good promises. And we pray these things in the precious name of our Saviour, our Lord, and our God, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm going to conclude our worship this evening uh, with this um, uh, hymn, Not What My Hands Have Done Could Save My Guilty Soul, Not What My Toiling Flesh Has Borne Can Make My Spirit Whole. It's Jesus, and Jesus alone, it can change us, and love us.
say the grace to one another. The grace, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.